Well, come on, let's praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, let's stand on our feet. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's Jesus Week Fellowship. Come on, we are excited. Jesus Week is here. So we've come to magnify his name. Come on, I need you to put those hands together. Do you love Jesus this morning? Come on, let me hear you. Do you love Jesus this morning? Come on, put those hands together. I really love you. I really love you. Because you first loved me. I really love you. Yes, I do. I really love you. Come on, say that. I really love you, Jesus. You can sing with us, say I really love, yeah. I really love you. I really love you. Because you first. Come on, I see it. We're one big choir. I really love you. Come on, I need you to say that one more time. I really love you. With all of my heart, Jesus.
Give God some praise this morning. Early in the morning will I seek thee. Come on, where are my early morning worshipers? Just take a few minutes and let God know I love you early in the morning. I woke up because I love you. I drove to church today on a Monday morning because we love you. Listen, fellowship, I just want to welcome you to our first 6 a.m. worship experience. Can we thank God for Jesus week? It's all about Jesus this week. And let me just say, my heart is big and smiling right now. That is not just me and Dr. Hall sitting up in here this morning. Do me a favor, hug two or three people around you. Say, good morning, good morning. Come on, hug them, tell them good morning. Yes, good to be alive, isn't it? What a blessing it is to be alive. Come on, one more time. Come on, praise team. Give it to us one more time. I love Jesus. Hey. I love you, Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Come on, let's give God praise for Jesus today. We give God praise for Jesus. Listen, I know that you know that 6 a.m. we don't waste time at this service. We get to the point at this service and there's a preacher in the house at this service. Can we welcome for the third year in a row the one and only Dr. Daryl E. Hall and his wife Ebony Hall back to the ship. Come on, welcome them. Y'all can get louder than that. Let them know we appreciate you. We're praying for you. We're getting ready to listen to the introductory video. We will only play this on this day because for the rest of the week, it'll be praise team and preacher and we gone. Amen. But I just wanted you all to know it feels good to have you back. And we're so glad and we're praying that God will fill you all four days with his anointing, his power, his clarity. His wisdom, his energy, his strength will be your strength for the rest of this week. May you even be shocked by the way the Holy Ghost takes over you this week. It is so in Jesus' name. Help me thank God for the presence of Reverend Thomas Gardner, our preacher from yesterday. Welcome back. That's a real brother to wake up after preaching yesterday and show up at 6 a.m. You may be seated. Let's draw our attention to the screen. Thank you, media team. Dr. Daryl Hall is called to preach the Word of God with integrity and freshness to hearers of all generations and nations. Dr. Hall has received bachelor's and master's degrees from Luther Rice Seminary, and he completed his doctorate of ministry degree from Beeson Divinity School at Samford University. For nearly 20 years, Dr. Hall served faithfully at Elizabeth Baptist Church in roles varying from usher to campus pastor. And in January of 2023, he became the pastor and founder of The Way Community Church. Dr. Hall's contribution to the kingdom and the world is to influence significance by helping ordinary people discover their unique significance. Good morning. God be praised. You can stay on your feet. Thank you so much to those who are standing. If you're not, I encourage you to. Thank you for uh, the warm hospitality and welcome to allow me and my wife to come back to sail on the ship with you, uh, to spend these um, priceless moments of, uh, of reflection and worship and devotion and uh, what could be said to be the most important week on the Christian calendar. And so this is a sacred space and you are a sacred people and we are grateful to be here to be a part of what God is doing. And uh, my brother beat me to it. He thanked me for coming back. But I am eternally grateful 
that now he has uh, allowed me to stand in this space um, because of, of his conviction and heart and love for you and his willingness to be kind to me. Can we thank God for our pastor, for my brother and my friend? Come on, y'all. We can do a little bit better than that. Thank you, man. Uh, I typically say this uh, not, you know, just to keep saying it, but because I believe it's really true. There is only one Reginald Wayne Sharp Jr. And we have many peers and brothers who, uh, who sharpen one another and encourage each other in private, but it's not lost on me that I am blessed to be alive and preaching at the same time as the greatest preacher in my generation. And I pray God's longevity You know, to have a meteoric rise so early in life as you still navigate personhood and to still be a good dude after all of that, my prayer is that he sees all the way through and God lets him have a great finish, longevity, fullness, and fruitfulness in life and ministry. That is my prayer and my blessing for you, brother. And it's so easy to love him because of the one he loves. I don't know where she's at. Oh, can we thank God for Sister Bree? Lord, have mercy on me. I mean, if you've never seen two people who just belong together, like peanut butter and jelly, you know? I don't know who put peanut butter with jelly. I believe that was God's work. And the same is true to put two oily people, two soulful people, two black people, two brilliant people. She is all of that in her own right, and we thank God for her. Can we give God praise for our pastor's wife, our first lady, my sister, and my friend? And then last but not least, uh, I'm not the only Reverend Hall in the household anymore. Yesterday, my wife preached her first sermon. Lord have mercy on me. I was just trying to focus on the word. I was like, girl, that girl look good up there, number one. <laughs> and number B, her sermon was magnificent. And uh, I'm so thankful just for her growth, her evolution. She been my girlfriend since I was 17 and I'm 37 and I'm not tired yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, if you have your Bibles, I want you to join me uh, in the book of Luke. Uh, Luke's gospel is distinct uh, in, in his telling of the story and life of Jesus. Uh, Luke presents Jesus as son of man. Uh, this is this self-revelatory statement Jesus gives about how he sees himself and essentially in the book of Luke Jesus wants to identify with our humanity everybody say humanity, humanity. all right uh, the first year Pastor Sharp extended the invitation we spent time in the book of Mark looking at the, the quick action pace between the days then last year we considered Jesus as king because Matthew presents king and kingdom and we saluted our king. Yeah. This year, we'll spend some time with Luke appreciating uh, that God became man. It's a few reasons why I'm still a Christian. One of them is because the God I worship chose to enter the life I live It's like I know it, but I don't understand it. But I'm so grateful for it. So here's the big idea for the week. I want you to think about this every day in between times. To be human is to struggle. Okay. I don't want you to think about doing this week, I want you to think about being. 
to be human is to struggle and Jesus chose and celebrated his own humanity. All right, Luke chapter 19 is where we're going to be. There are two verses I'll read. Luke 19 verse 47 through 48. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. The word of the Lord says, and he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to put him to death. And yet they could not find anything that they might do. For all the people, hear me now, were hanging on to every word he said. On his way to the cross, he spends time in the temple teaching and everybody is hanging on to every word he says. For the few minutes I have to share with you, I want you to think about this thought, the struggle with the faith. You may be seated in the presence of the living God. The struggle with the faith. Randy Pausch, like our Jesus, died one Friday. The date of his death, to be exact, is June 25th, 2008. And the death of our Lord Jesus was Passover Friday, circa AD 30. If you've never heard the name Randy Pausch, I commend to you his book called The Last Lecture. Pausch was a, uh, an esteemed professor at the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And for a decade, he taught at that school until he found out in 2006 that he had pancreatic cancer that had metastasized to the level that his life was now limited and his mortality was imminent. And so as he began to stare death in the face, he had to make a few crucial choices of how he would use his last days in order to be remembered. As a professor at Carnegie Mellon, he participated in this ritual they have called the last lecture. Whenever uh, a professor is preparing to retire or to leave, the school will organize it such that whatever parting words that professor wants to use to punctuate their tenure, they have a secret space and a special time to do just that. And so what Pouch did was, was he leveraged his last lecture to fill it with lessons for his children. Because he knew he wouldn't have time to teach his students and raise his children. So in his last lecture, he put everything they would need to exist and subsist when he was gone. I commend the book to you. It's one of the most brilliant pieces I've ever read. I believe Luke captures Jesus' last lecture. In chapter 19, we note that on the Monday of Jesus' week, Passion Week, A.D. 30, that he's in the temple teaching and he's teaching his disciples not just his core group but this crowd who would often follow him and hang on the text says to his every word i think that in this moment jesus is teaching because he understands the struggle they're going to have with the faith once he's no longer on the scene. So he's teaching as human to humans to strengthen them for the faith they're going to need for a journey they cannot predict. I think Jesus knew uh, what we have come to learn, and that is this, that the last words of a dying person have more value and weight and meaning to the people who survived them. And so I think he made his words count. Luke 19, 
has parallels in uh, Matthew 21 and in Mark 11. But what's interesting, when we contrast these synoptic gospels, we find that there are some details in one that are not in others. And I'm, I'm, I'm bothered. I can't wait to have a conversation with Luke about this when I get to heaven. But I'm bothered about the details he left out. <laughs> Here's why I'm bothered. Because Luke says from the outset that he intentionally investigated all of these stories so he can lay it out for Theophilus in part one, Luke, and in part two, Acts. So I don't understand why he includes the temple but leaves out the tree. Matthew talks about the tree. Mark talks about the tree. But Luke, as a trained physician who for 10 years followed Paul and investigated these stories, leaves out the tree but includes, hear me, the teaching in the temple. Because I think Luke is trying to get at what Jesus is teaching in this last moment he has to really share his heart with the people he loves most. He doesn't include the content, though, of what Jesus is teaching. <laughs> so my question is, what is Jesus talking about in his last lecture? And we can look back through the book of Luke and we can see that he gave many parables. And uh, in chapter 11, he taught them how to pray. And he, he gave many examples that would sturdy and solidify their faith. So even though Luke doesn't include the content, I don't think it's a disrespect of the text to assume that whatever Jesus was teaching was to build their faith. Everybody say faith. faith. Yeah, I believe Jesus used his teaching in Passion Week to build their faith because he knew after he was gone from this moment forward, once Monday turns to Tuesday, the struggle is going to be real. What you mean, Rev? Here's the first thing we'll note. Number one, we all struggle with faith. When things get worse before they get better. <laughs> Woo! You ever thought you was a real good believer? <laughs> and then things start getting worse than what you had the threshold of pain to, 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 to endure. And then you realize the struggle you have with your faith when things start to get worse before they get better. <laughs> it was George Lewis Parks Jr., the pastor of Metropolitan in D.C., who said that Jesus had a good day after he had a bad week. <laughs> because from Monday down to Friday, his week is going to progressively get worse and worse as the days go by. As a matter of fact, things got so bad between Monday and Saturday that the disciples who heard him teach for three years forgot everything he said in one week. Because we struggle with faith when things get worse before they get better. When you expected them to get better, but all they do is get worse. One week can unravel three years of theology. You can think you know everything you need to know about God. And then you can have a bad week and have questions in your mind of the goodness of God, the love of God, or the presence of God. Is there anybody looking at me who can testify, Reverend? That's why I got up at 6 a.m. Because I've had... Had a bad week of time or two that has tested in my faith. If they were not struggling with the faith, the moment Jesus got arrested and convicted and crucified, they would have went straight to Galilee. Because he told them that I'm going to lay down my life in three days. I'm going to take it up. And when I rise again, I'll meet y'all over in Galilee. But proof that they were struggling with their faith is that their actions betray their unbelief. I think sometimes we don't even realize we struggle with faith until things get worse before they get better. But then also, number two, we struggle with faith when we have to wait until later for what we expect it to get now. <laughs> oh. 
You ever ask God for something and then got real, real bold in your request and put a time stamp on it? Lord, I need some money by the first, God. It's the 12th, so I'm telling you in advance. You got 16 days to do it, Lord. Well, 17, because it's February, but it's a leap year. So I'm giving you an advance notice of what I'm going to need. And you think you're being a good Christian. I'm really putting my faith to work. A week passed, but now, Lord, it's a week later. <laughs> the first is a week closer. I need this amount of money by this deadline. And here you are the night before the first, really realizing that your faith is not what you thought it was going to be. Because the Lord didn't move in your way and in your time. I think, Shark, that Jesus is teaching them on Monday to build their faith because he knows, in a way, he's going to disappoint them on Friday. There are a few things in the life of a believer that test our faith other than disappointment. And God routinely disappoints us by making us wait to later to get something we ask him for now. <laughs> Reverend, what you talking about? These good Jews who, who believed the Old Testament prophecies expected that the Messiah would come and overthrow Rome. So what they were looking for is a mighty general on a white horse with a sword in his hand to lead the charge to go kill Caesar and take over Rome. But what they got was a lowly savior who came clip clopping into town on a donkey who instead of going to overthrow Rome with a sword said, no, first I'm going to overthrow hell on a cross. <laughs> what do you do when God is going to do what he said he's going to do, but he's just not going to do it yet? What do you do when God answers your prayer by giving you a version of it you didn't ask him for, but you really needed more than what you asked him for? And so now you got to be happy with what you have until he does what he says he's going to do. What do you do when he saves you from your sin before he liberates you from your oppressor? Is there anybody in the house who can testify, Reverend, you ain't the only one who's had to wait a little while longer than you anticipated to get something God told you he was going to give you? It could be said that the church age it's just one long era of disappointment for Jews. Because <laughs> Jews thought their Messiah was coming to save them. <laughs> they never realized that he was coming to save us. So it could be said that the last 2,000 years is just one long era of disappointment. Why? Because we're waiting on him to come back to do the second time what we thought he was going to do the first time. But is there anybody who can testify, I don't mind waiting on you, Lord. You ought to give God a hand clap of praise and thank him for the fact that even in my season of waiting, he'll bring fruit that I never thought I could have or even ask for. All right, y'all, I'm almost done. I think Jesus is teaching them in the temple as a human to humans. And he's got to be teaching them something to build their faith because he knows they're going to struggle with it. He knows that they're going to struggle with faith by waiting until later to get what they thought they were going to get now. He knows this week is going to get worse before it gets better. Here's the third thing, y'all, and I'll be done. I think we also struggle with the faith when what we hoped would be easy actually becomes difficult. <laughs> All right, listen, you ain't get up at 6 a.m. in the morning to come lie to me, so just be honest. <laughs> Have you ever, as a believer, hoped that some seasons in your life 
would have been easier than they turned out to be. Yeah. <laughs> We think that if I just, if I just, if I just give my tithes, if I just stay faithful to my devotion, if I just, you know, obey what the Lord has told me to do, you know, if I just be a good person and forgive and release folk who do me wrong, if I just, you know, don't turn my back on people in need, if I just come to church on a Sunday for three services and then back to church on a Monday at six, if I just do a good job being a good Christian, maybe God, you will make this life a little easier. But the truth is, life is difficult. And we really are at a crisis of faith when what we hope would be easy turns out to be difficult. <laughs> what you mean, Rev? He, he's teaching this group of disciples and particularly the apostles who had walked with him might have an unrealistic expectation of how easy it's going to be to be who God has called them to be and do what God has called them to do. I want you to hear me. Because when you're close to your leader, the training you get in the simulator doesn't tell you the hell you're going to have to go through to become your leader when your leader is no longer on the scene. Let me run that back. If you've ever tried to become anything in any arena in life and you had a mentor who helped to groom you and prepare you to become that thing or you became a parent after watching your parents parent you, what you do not understand is that while you're under their leadership, things will look and feel easier than they're actually going to be when they're no longer on the scene and you can never predict the hell you're going to have to go through to become who you want to become and who you see them being. You didn't know all the hell your mama went through having children until you became a mama too. You didn't know how tough it was to be a father until you became a father too. You used to complain about your boss and about the one who was leading you at work until you became the one who was in charge and you trying to get folk to do what they said they were going to do and get paid to do. You thought it was going to be easy to be anointed. You thought it was going to be easy to get that promotion. You thought it was going to be easy to be who God called you to be and do what God called you to do. Little did you know hell was waiting on you in your place of promotion. And you found yourself fighting for the faith while celebrating the opportunity. Is there anybody who can testify reverend? That's why I love Jesus because he keep it a hundred. He don't never let me walk into a situation without preparing me by my faith to survive. What you mean, Rev? In Luke chapter 9, verse 1, he called the 12 and gave them power and authority over all the demons. And that was easy work. They were so happy when they went out, they were casting out demons, telling all the devils what to do. And then they came back saying, Jesus, you wouldn't even believe how all them demons just do what we said do. Then in Luke chapter 10, he called 72 and sent them out two by two and said, hey, go preach. Go wherever you want. You know, if you go to a house and they bless you, bless them back, eat the food, they're going to meet all your needs. And they walked out empty handed with nothing in their pockets, just being obedient, so happy to find success. What they did not know is this was the simulator. The book of Luke is simulation. The book of Acts is real world. So they could have went into Acts thinking it was going to be easier than it actually was. And what they did not know in the book of Acts is you will face persecution in the real world trying to become who you was told you was going to be back in the simulator. And I don't think they could predict that. But I think Jesus knew. So he taught them to build up their faith. I can't let go while Luke didn't include the tree. But I think the mistake I'm making is God wants me to be an apostle while I'm trying to be an arborist. <laughs> I'm 
I'm so caught up on the tree, he's like, you missed the point of the tree. Because even if the tree was included, the tree wasn't a magic trick. It was about teaching them that if you curse a tree and it dies, how to use your faith when you need it in the future. Here's all I came to tell you. When you're in the streets, Jesus will teach his crew. But then when you come in the sanctuary, Jesus will teach his congregation. And sometimes you will see a withered tree in the streets that makes you come in the temple with questions. Now, how in the world did he do that? And whether it's in the streets or the sanctuary, whatever Jesus is teaching, he's always teaching it to build your faith. I'm sure that one of the 12 was like me, Thomas, who, who while he was teaching in the temple, peeked back out to look at that tree. Now, how in the world did he wither that tree? He told us that was about faith. Now I'm in the temple and he's teaching about faith. Put two and two together on this Monday, that must mean that you're not going to be able to survive the rest of this week without your faith. <laughs> no matter how bad the struggle gets, remember that we cannot make it without our faith. Let the church shout faith. Especially y'all here at the ship. Don't you understand that we're sailing on this ship by faith? It was our founder who after an elongated period trying to build this building was still able to put a roof on this sucker by faith. It was his successor that took the ship to deeper waters and greener pastures than we had ever been and he did so by it was your pastor who came to a church in a pandemic having to preach to an empty room and his hope was is that even though he was in a room all alone he wasn't in this church all alone and he started his pastoring by what church without faith it is impossible to please him we walk by faith and not by sight those who come to him must have faith is there anybody who can testify God if you give me anything this week give me just a little bit more I'm done y'all somebody please Somebody asked me, Rev, why would he teach about faith? Wow. Put it in the chat. If you're sailing on the virtual ship, somebody put it, why, 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 why? Ask me one more time. Somebody say, why? why? I think that Jesus used his last lecture before life started life. Wow. I told y'all I'm a member of the ship. I be watching from where I am for the last month. Our pastor has been telling us that life will start life. In. And Jesus knew that before life starts life, in, I need to build your faith. Is there anybody grateful for the fact that God will ground you before the wind start blowing? God will fill you before the world starts pulling. God will anchor you before the waves start crashing. You ought to open your mouth, put your hands together, and and give God praise for your faith. Can we thank God for Dr. Daryl Hall? Lord, increase our faith. That's why we all gathered this morning at 6 o'clock. Not here for show or fashion. But we want the Lord to increase our faith. At this time, I want to ask if there's anyone here who does not know Jesus. This Jesus who will walk with you, who will pour into you to increase your faith so that you can have a closer walk with him, so you can get some of the access that only life with Jesus grants. We want to encourage you to come at this time to accept Christ. Perhaps you want to join a church that is walking on faith, that is built on faith. We encourage you to join us at this time. Information right there is on the screen if you are a virtual member. We encourage you to join us to text us to email us to unite with us as we are increasing our faith here at the ship if you need christ if you need a church home we would love to have you we would love to have you
Family, at this time, I want to welcome, I want to welcome our intercessors to the altar. I want to welcome our intercessors to the altar. Amen. This is an atmosphere that has been charged with faith. Amen. And I believe that those of you who are here, if you need special prayer, we invite you down. We invite you down to these intercessors who are at the altar. And we're going to pray and we're going to believe God that whatever you stand in need of, we are going to join our faith with your faith. And we believe that God can do some miraculous things. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give the benediction at this time. And even after the benediction, you're welcome to come to this altar. We're going to close in prayer. But we encourage you. We encourage you to unite your faith with ours. Lord, we pray that as we go down from this place, God, we never leave your presence. May our struggles keep us near the cross. May our troubles show, God, that we really need you. May our battles, Lord, end the way they should. And may our entire lives prove, God, that you are good. We pray, Lord, that each and every day that our lives prove, Lord, that you are good. You are dismissed. We are going to be praying. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, for how you increase our faith daily. We thank you, God, that we've got up this morning with some abilities of our limbs, God. We thank you that we had breath in our body, God. We thank you, Lord, that you did not count it a robbery, God, that we would uh, be able to be here this morning. Lord, we love you. We adore you, God. We, we worship you even now, God. We, we thank you, God. We, 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 we just simply lift up our hands and say thank you, God for all you have done God you've been good to us you've been so so good to us God you allowed us God to see another day we don't take it for granted God when people are leaving this earth in record numbers God you saw fit God to allow us to be here God and we are grateful to you God we are grateful for this word God that has encouraged us to return to you God the giver of our faith God we lean into you today Lord we lean into you God as we as it relates to all the burdens we are carrying God and we we lean into you today God as it relates to all the many things that are on our mind God we need our faith increased God we need to know God that you have never left us and because you've never left us, God, we know that we have a constant companion, God. Because you never left us, God, we know you are omnipresent in our life, God. Help increase our faith. God, many times in the Bible, people come to you, God. A man came to you, God, and said that, uh, I believe, God, but help my unbelief. <laughs> so help us in the areas, God, that we have unbelief god yes we believe you that you can help us in our finances god but we do sometimes have wavering faith as it relates to our health so help us in the areas god where we don't believe god some of us may believe god that you are able to help our children get on the right path god but we don't know if you can rest our mind god help us in the areas of our unbelief increase our faith god allow our experiences with you that's it allow what we experience with you god to become a testimony that we can look to to know god that we can always go back to the place where you have worked it out before god and we know if you have done it in other areas of our life god you are able to do it again in a new area of our life thank you god for reminding us that you will increase our faith and God, because of that, we are going to leave this place knowing, God, that you are able to do the miraculous. Whatever we stand in need of, God, whatever miracle we need to take place, God, we stand knowing that you're able. But God, even if you don't do what we want you to do, increase our faith enough to continue to walk with you increase our faith enough to continue to trust you increase our faith to know God that you will never leave us 
nor forsake us. And God, even in when we don't get what we want to get, show us the lessons, God. Show us the wisdoms we should be extracting from the situations that may break our heart. Show us, God, how we can help somebody else after going through what we're going through. God, because sometimes what we go through isn't for us. It's for us to help the hundreds of others that will come to us. Increase our faith, God. Increase our faith so that when we see situations that don't look like you, we can speak to them and say, mountain, be thou removed. When we see situations that don't look like you, we can say, peace, be still. When we see situations that don't look like you, we can say, get behind these Satan. Because God, we know if our faith increases, God, we can go out and do the miraculous things that you said that we would be able to do. Lord, you said greater works will we be able to do. So we speak, God, an increase of our faith. And as a collective, as a church body, you know what we stand in need of. God, you showed our pastor's vision. And God, we believe that by faith, by faith, by faith, God, what you have shown our pastor shall come to pass and allow our faith to link up with his as we go out for this big catch on Easter Sunday. Allow our faith, God, to connect with those in our community, those who are unsaved, those who are unchurched, those who have been pushed to the margins, those who have been forgotten. Allow us to go out and get them and allow us to make the sacrifice Allow us to make the sacrifices of our finances so that we can see miracles even in our own life as we see them in the church. Increase our faith, Lord. And Lord, when you do this, we'll be careful to give your name all of the glory. It will not be by our name. It will be by the name of Jesus that we are able to see our faith increase. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. The altar is open. The altar. The altar is open. Go in peace. Go in peace. Go in peace. Go in peace. Yes, I love you. How I love you. I really love you Just for who you are In all of your glory My heart sings Holy, holy You are everything I need you to be you are the great I am just for who you are, just for who you are in all of your glory. My heart sings, My heart sings. holy, holy.
your hands and say worship him. Oh, worship him come on this is the atmosphere to receive whatever it is that you need from God All we have to do say bow down and worship him. Worship him. Worship him. Oh, worship him. Oh, worship him. Bow down and worship him. Enter in. Enter in. Oh. Next part, Cons- 
2024. Join us tonight as we receive from the dynamic music ministry of guest psalmist Melvin Crispell III, Jesus Talk with Dr. Brianna Parker, and we'll hear a powerful message from the Reverend Dr. Brandon Crowley. Jesus Week 2024 at Fellowship Chicago.